Good morning. morning. Or as our ancestors used to say, Guten Morgen. My name is uh, Pastor Ken Seavers. I, uh, somebody asked me that question. I'm not related to any of the Seavers in Jackson. Uh, I'm a Southern Illinois Seavers, grew up around Hamill, Illinois, and uh, uh, I think my relatives came over on another boat, uh, at least the Seavers ones, uh, and uh, immigrated through uh, the port of New York City. Uh, probably shortly before the Civil War. Uh, one of my uh, ancestors had too many boys and they weren't rich and, and uh, so the boys had to uh, either marry rich gals uh, that had farmland or immigrate, so uh, they immigrated. But anyway, uh, I've been retired for a while. Uh, been in this area before. I served uh, for, for 10 years from 1976 to 1986 at Concordia in Sykeston. And, uh, uh, neighbor, uh, mentored and uh, have as one of my uh, good friends, Pastor Benkendorf, who used to be at Frona, and I get real close to here often. I uh, preach at Frona about twice a year, so, so the, uh, the high altitude up there won't affect me. It, uh, uh, I, I'm still working on the timing a little bit. I, it takes me a little longer every year to, to reach such heights. Uh, and uh, and uh, to, to look up at people when you preach is not something you do that often as a pastor, so that, that is... Uh, that is, that is interesting. But it's a pleasure to lead you in worship uh, during this in-between time when you don't have a pastor personally, but uh, uh, we enjoy the opportunity to share the word with God with you and, uh, and look forward to shaking your hands on the way out this morning and wishing you God's blessings. And uh, uh, where two or three of us gather together and we've more than met that uh, quota, the Lord is with us and will bless and receive our worship this morning. So let's begin by uh, singing the opening hymn.
We follow the order of service this morning on page 260, the service of prayer and preaching. Please rise. This is the day which the Lord has made. From the rising of the sun to its setting, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Sanctify us in your truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy And you may be seated. The word of God that greets our eager ears this morning from the Old Testament is found in the book of Numbers, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 4th verse. A rather surprising and uplifting response of our Lord God to the grumblings, I like the King James word mumblings, of God's Old Testament people. Now the rabble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. Remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping through their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt with ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all the people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom like a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their families? Or am I going to get meat to give to all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden's too heavy for me. 
If you treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came in the cloud and spoke to them and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two remained in the camp, one named Eldad, the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? And here's the punchline. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. James speaks to us this morning from his epistle, the fifth chapter, these inspired words. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted in your garments, are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider these blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But of all my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. If there is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. Is anyone among you said, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brethren, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. You may remain seated for that also. And John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. 
For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. One of our Lord's many gifts to his church here on earth through Dr. Martin Luther uh, is the small catechism. Uh, a document that we are all very familiar with because of our confirmation tradition. Uh, a, a document uh, often requested of me when I was down in Syxton by members in the community who uh, were not Lutheran, who just loved the way Luther's small catechism with the questions and the answers uh, laid out the ABCs of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, although the small catechism, uh, unlike the large catechism, was written for parents to use at home uh, to teach their children the most important truths of the Christian faith, it also serves us well today in our worship as we joyfully recite together the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and after that, the Lord's Prayer. The Ten Commandments together. You shall have... Finally, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. And we sing the sermon hymn.
And Jesus said in this morning's gospel lesson, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace this morning from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who would salt us again this morning with his holy word so that his Holy Spirit might empower us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world that he has called each of us to be. Now, when I was young, one of the first things I would often do after I sat down to eat after praying was to reach for that good old salt shaker and liberally salt all of my food. You're smiling. Some of you had that same habit. Maybe still do. You're right. Not a good idea. Inevitably, my doctor told me that some years ago, and so I don't salt my food so much anymore. And frankly, for the most part, I don't miss salt all that much. Today, we take salt pretty much for granted, don't we? It's cheap. It is readily available. In fact, I I checked the other day in the store and I found out, Walmart to be exact, that a 26-ounce shaker of salt still costs, would you believe, 67 cents. What can you buy for 67 cents today that has any value? But it wasn't always that way, especially in our Lord's day. Back then... Salt was one of the most expensive and hard-to-get commodities around. In fact, it was so scarce and it was so valuable that it was often used as money. Would you believe that? Instead of silver and gold. People actually were paid for their labor in salt. By the way, that's where the word salary comes from. That's where the expression, he or she is worth his salt or her salt comes from. Did you all collect your salt money last payday? Or did you just get your Social Security check from the government like I did? So, when Jesus says in our gospel lesson this morning, everyone will be salted and have salt in yourselves, the importance of his words to his first hearers and to us this morning should not pass us by. For as he said in his Sermon on the Mount, we, God's people, are called to be the salt of the earth. We followers of Jesus are to be God's seasoning agents in our world. We believers in the Lord are the salt that he sends out to season the whole world with the good news of salvation by grace and through faith in him. Now one of the marvelous things that salt does for our food is it may things taste salty. But you know, it does a lot more than that. Uh, In in many cases, it brings out a food's delicious flavors, locks in their natural juices, gives them an entirely new or or different taste, especially preserves them. I remember an old gentleman friend of mine who once said, you know, salt just makes my beans taste like beans and my potatoes taste like mashed potatoes. And if that's what just a little common table salt can do for our food, just think what you and I, or what Jesus through us can do for our world whenever we take his call to be the salt of the earth seriously. His call to share the salt of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of God's love and forgiveness for everyone, with everyone and anyone, every chance we get. I think think we sometimes forget how how, how many wonderful opportunities Jesus gives us throughout our life to do that, to be his salt, to be his seasoning agents. First of all, all the opportunities in our homes. What wonderful opportunities you husbands and wives have in your homes every day in the forgiving intimacy of your relationship to salt each other with God's love with understanding, with encouragement. What wonderful opportunities you have as parents or as grandparents 
or in some cases as great-grandparents to salt the lives of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren with your love, with your faith, with your values, with your ideas. Salt your heads with those. Salt their hearts with the love of God. Salt their lips with God-pleasing speech. Salt their hands and arms and legs with all sorts of praiseworthy activities. And oh, how I thank Almighty God every day for willing me to be born in a Christian home. For giving me some awesome, salty parents who were truly God's salt of the earth, not just to me and my younger brother and my sister, but to many others in the church, in in my extended family, in my community. Even today when I go back home, people talk about what wonderful Christian parents my mom and my dad were. Secondly, what wonderful opportunities God gives us all the time to be his salt in and through our participation in his special family, the church. Not just the church throughout the world, but the community of believers as we gather together Sunday after Sunday together in his house. Through our participation in that, just think of all the precious opportunities your pastors have had over the years to salt you with the word of God, sometimes with a word of comfort, sometimes a word of forgiveness, sometimes a word of advice, sometimes a word of hope, sometimes with just a caring smile or a loving hug. To salt you with the word of God to equip you for your job as God's seasoning agents. Don't forget all the wonderful opportunities you have each week as church members to be the salt of the earth. To worship together, to pray together, to serve together, to depend on each other for help and advice, for a kind word, for a sympathetic ear, a strong shoulder to cry on or lean on, or just to love each other. I think sometimes you forget how rich in salt you are and how salty you are as you simply live together for Jesus in a community, be it small or large, for a lifetime together, letting your light so shine, salting each other with God's love in thought, word, and deed, making Jesus real in you to one another. Finally, what wonderful opportunities God gives all of us to be his salting agents in the world, to be a salt in the world. Why, every day we are surrounded by people who do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way. And not just overseas, not running around in jungles in Africa somewhere, or on a sandy beach somewhere, but right here in beautiful places like Altenburg, Missouri. In fact, according to recent surveys, the majority of American citizens today have yet to be successfully salted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, have not yet come to know Jesus in a meaningful way, have not come as we have to depend upon him, to draw our strength from him each day. And so I sadly suspect that the number of people dying every day without Jesus in their hearts continues to grow. Oh, salting is so important. And that's why Jesus says, Go ye therefore and be my salt of the earth, and have salt in yourselves. Now, as is so often the case, our Lord's, our Lord's powerful words of encouragement to us in our gospel lesson this morning also come with a strong and I think almost frightening word of warning, don't they? For he says, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Unfortunately, the salt that people used in our Lord's day was not ionized. I'm not very good on science, so I won't get into that why that's the case and what the difference that makes. But, but, but today, because salt is ionized, it doesn't lose its saltiness. It can sit on a shelf for years and still salt your food the next time you reach for it. But in Jesus' day, because salt was not ionized, 
It would only retain its salting ability for a limited period of time. And so if it wasn't quickly used, it would lose its saltiness and it would literally have to be thrown away, thrown outside into the roadway to be trampled on by everyone walking by. Of course, we too, as God's salt of the earth, live under limitations as well. We do not live on this earth forever, do we? And most of you have lived long enough as I see that you understand that. Went to a funeral of a good friend again yesterday. There are limitations, a limited number of salting days that we are given during our earthly lifetime. So, if we don't use our salt seasoning ability in Christian life, if we don't care to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in thought, word, and deed as best as we can, if we don't support the Lord's work with our time and talents and treasures and prayers, if we don't faithfully participate in our Lord's saving and salting mission of the world, then, to the true God, we have become as salt that has lost its saltiness, totally useless, totally worthless to him. Now, is God really serious about that, you might ask? Well, if you have any doubts about that, just look at the verses that precede our text. Here's what Jesus says in those words. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, for it's better to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. You bet. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is serious about wanting us to be his salt of the earth. Thankfully, the blessed faith fact is that God, through his Holy Spirit, has called us to faith and therefore has given each of us the ability to be the salt of the earth. If you believe in Jesus, you're a salty son or daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that? You are. You don't need to be a pastor to be a faithful salter. You don't need a seminary degree to be a salter. In fact, it's been my observation over the years that some of God's most effective salters aren't pastors or church professionals at all, but simple, faithful Christian people just like you who go about the business day after day of living faithful Christian lives, loving, helping, caring, praying for other people, being bright lights in their homes, their church, and their communities. They simply take our Lord's great commission and command to be the salt of the earth seriously every day, and so they live for Jesus. And you know, the more salting you do, the more salty you become, and the more comfortable and confident you will feel as you just continue to salt away every day for Jesus. And so when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and remember that you are the salt of the earth and that the day will bring salting opportunities for you. In the Old Testament, God's people, in anticipation of the coming of Jesus and his wonderful sacrifice for us on Good Friday to atone for all of our sins, they were commanded to make various kinds of sacrifices to God. Many chapters in the Old Testament talk about the details of that, don't they? That's the part of the Bible we often skip over. I understand that. But with some of these offerings, they were commanded to actually salt those offerings uh, to make them taste good, if you will, acceptable to God. And so our lives, too, as living sacrifices to God for Jesus' sake, taste better to God when they are salted. I love what the Apostle Paul says about that in his letter to the Romans. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your, and I'm going to add, salty bodies. He doesn't have that word salty in there. But to present your bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When you are a faithful psalter, you give our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit one of the most precious kinds of worship you can ever offer them. So please don't forget our Lord's holy words in this morning's gospel lesson. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all of our human understanding keep our hearts and minds focused on our Savior serving work in us and through us, in our families, in our church families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our world. And all God's people said, Amen and your gifts will now be gathered. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift might be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. We stand for the prayers. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world. And for the proclamation of the gospel and for calling all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, for the widowed and the orphaned, for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. And finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, so that by the patience and comfort of your holy word may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. 
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join together in the morning prayer. I thank you, my... Let us bless the Lord. Be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. We sing the closing hymn.
my church in St. Louis was, uh, I better get here. My church in St. Louis was right along a main street, and I just, I like the idea of people, not to see me so much as people coming out of worship, but anyway. I have oh, okay. I'll put, it, I'll put it back on. All right, sounds good. Happy large day, brother. Oh, you come back.